Hello. So the topic of this lecture is key concepts in shock. Now, shock can be not only overwhelming for the patient, but also for you as the provider trying to take care of a patient who is crashing. So it's really important that you understand the pathophysiology of shock so that as you go through the algorithm and are going through the appropriate treatments, if something isn't working, you can understand what the process is and try to troubleshoot to save the patient's life. Our objectives are going to be first to compare and contrast the three types of shock, but almost the entire talk will be focusing on describing the pathophysiology of septic shock because that's really quite complicated. So what is shock? So the simplest definition is you have diminished cardiac output or reduced effective circulating blood volume, which leads to impaired tissue perfusion and cellular hypoxia. So that's shock in a nutshell. Now we generally think of there being three different types of shock, cardiogenic, hypovolemic, and septic. So cardiogenic shock occurs when you have intrinsic myocardial damage, such as a myocardial infarction, extrinsic pressure, for example, cardiac tamponade, or outflow obstruction, for example, a massive pulmonary embolism. This is going to cause failure of the myocardial pump, impaired tissue perfusion, and cellular hypoxia. Hypovolemic shock occurs when you have inadequate blood or plasma volume, which is going to le lead to impaired tissue perfusion, and cellular hypoxia. Now septic shock is when you bring in the severe systemic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS. This is going to lead to arterial vasodilation, vascular leakage, and venous blood pooling leading to impaired tissue perfusion and cellular hypoxia. This is a, a, a table from uh, Robin's Basic Pathology 10th edition, which goes through the three types of shock, gives some clinical examples, and the principal pathogenic mechanisms. So again, cardiogenic shock, you can see with myocardial infarction, a ventricular, a ventricular rupture, which you can see after a myocardial infarction, arrhythmia, cardiac tapenade, or pulmonary embolism. All of these can lead to failure of the myocardial pump. Hypovolemic shock, you can see in the case of uh, abundant hemorrhage or fluid loss due to vomiting, diarrhea, burns, or trauma. And once more, the mechanism is inadequate blood or plasma volume. Now, septic shock you can see with overwhelming microbial infections, gram-negative sepsis, gram-positive septicemia, fungal sepsis, uh, and superantigens such as toxic shock syndrome. And we're going to focus on the principal pathogenic mechanisms of septic shock for the next several slides. So these are the five main players uh, when we talk about the pathophysiology of septic shock. So inflammatory and counter-inflammatory responses, endothelial activation and injury, induction of a procoagulant state, metabolic abnormalities, and organ dysfunction. So we're going to go through these one by one. So this slide is going to focus on the inflammatory part of the inflammatory counter-inflammatory responses. So essentially, the microbial wall fragments bind to receptors on innate inflammatory cells. And this is going to cause the elaboration of a variety of mediators, including cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1, and interferon gamma, and inflammatory mediators like HMGB1, which is high mobility group box 1 protein. Now, after we go through all of these uh, different uh, factors in the pathophysiology of septic shock, we're going to go through in detail a really nice illustration from the next edition of Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. So it should all become a lot clearer then. Once you have these uh, inflammatory measures beginning, you're going to see an increase in C-reactive protein, which as you'll recall is a way of monitoring uh, inflammation in the body. You're going to get an increase in reactive oxygen species, uh, platelet activation factor, or PAF, prostaglandins, and these are going to lead to endothelial activation. Furthermore, the complement cascade is going to be activated by microbial products. All of this is going to lead to a hyperinflammatory state. So what does the body do? Well, it's going to try to retain homeostasis or return to homeostasis by bringing in some immunosuppressive mechanisms. So one, uh, these are a, a variety of proposed mechanisms, such as a shift from pro-inflammatory Th1 to anti-inflammatory Th2 cytokines. In addition, the body will begin producing uh, anti-inflammatory mediators, such as soluble tumor necrosis factor receptor, IL-1 receptor antagonist, and IL-10. Lymphocytes will be going under, will begin undergoing apoptosis, and there is an immunosuppressive effect of apoptotic cells. 
Furthermore, we'll have the induction of T-cell en energy. So basically, we're going to have a seesaw back and forth between inflammatory and counter-inflammatory responses in the body. The next major factor is endothelial activation and injury. So you have this pro-inflammatory state, which we just discussed, and we're going to get endothelial cell activation. When this happens, you get a loosening of the endothelial tight junctions, leading to vascular leakage and tissue edema. This is going to reduce your downstream perfusion because you no longer have the intravascular volume. You also have the release of a lot of vaso, uh, vasoactive inflammatory mediators, such as nitric oxide, C3A, C5A, and platelet activating factor. What these are going to do is they're going to act on the vascular smooth muscle, causing relaxation, leading to systemic hypotension. So once more, this is leading to decreased tissue perfusion. The next major factor is induction of a procoagulant state. So there are a number of pro-inflammatory cytokines that are being released in this inflammation that we're seeing. These pro-inflammatory cytokines are going to have a variety of downstream effects. They're going to increase tissue factor production, and they're going to decrease the endothelial anticoagulant factors. So these include things like tissue factor pathway inhibitor, thrombomodulin, and protein C. These pro-inflammatory cytokines are also going to have an effect on the endothelial tight junctions leading to vascular leakage and tissue edema. They're going to increase pl plasminogen actor inhibitor 1, which is going to decrease fibrinolysis, all of this leading to increased coagulation. We're going to have decreased blood flow because, as we have discussed, we're having fluid leaking out of the intravascular space. When this happens, you're going to get stasis, so the blood is uh, more congested and it's not flowing as well. Now, as you recall from hemostasis, one of the ways that we maintain hemostasis is that we have washing away of activated coagulation factors. But without vigorous good blood flow, we don't get this. This is going to lead to systemic thrombin activation and the formation of fibrin thrombi. So this is really uh, not good. It's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite dangerous for the patient. This is going to lead to disseminated intravascular coagulation. So another factor that comes in in the pathogenesis septic shock is you're going to notice that your patients are going to have metabolic abnormalities, primarily hyperglycemia and insulin resistance. The, the reason that they get this is because there are a variety of factors that we've mentioned that are elaborated, uh, partially due to stress. Uh, so TNF, IL-1, uh, glucagon, growth hormone, uh, glucocorticoids, and catecholamines, uh, the last three are, are uh, elicited by the stress response, are going to lead to gluconeogenesis. And this is going to result in hyperglycemia. In addition, you have pro-inflammatory cytokines that are going to suppress insulin release while promoting insulin resistance. And they do this by impairing expression of GLUT4, a glucose transporter. Now, hyperglycemia is going to decrease neutrophil function, and the cellular hypoxia and decreased oxidative phosphorylation are going to lead to lacti uh, lactate production and lactic acidosis. So this is why when your patient is going through septic shock, you need to be keeping an eye on their arterial blood gases and uh, see if they're having uh, acidosis so that you can treat that. And finally, we have organ dysfunction. So we have the systemic hypotension with interstitial edema and small vessel thrombosis. All of these are going to lead to decreased oxygen and nutrients to the tissues. Oxidative stress is going to damage the mitochondria and further impair oxygen use. The high levels of cytokines and the secondary mediators are going to impair myocardial contractility and cardiac output. And the increased vascular permeability and endothelial injury is going to perhaps lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome. So you can see why so much is going on in this patient who has septic shock that needs to be addressed through fluids, through pressors, uh, keeping the, uh, the, the intravascular volume uh, moving. All right, so now we get to spend some time looking at this really fantastic uh, uh, figure because I think it really puts everything together. All right, so we'll begin at the top. So we have microbes and microbial uh, product. And these are going to uh, have these, what we call uh, the pathogen-associated molecular pattern, or PAMP, which is going to be recognized by our inflammatory cells here by toll-like receptors, or TLR.
all right? And these uh, can cause uh, direct endothelial injury, right, and endothelial activation. Now, once these neutrophils and monocytes are activated through binding to PAMPs, they're going to uh, begin releasing uh, cytokines and cytokine-like mediators. So I already mentioned TNF, IL-1, and HMGB-1. As I mentioned, you're going to have increased reactive oxygen species, uh, prostaglandins uh, will be released, and platelet activating factor. We're also going to have fever, and the elaboration of uh, these uh, complement factors, because we get activation of complement through this, uh, the microbial products. So microbial products are going to activate complement, complement's going to come in here, and we're going to be in this pro-inflammatory state. Okay, and the pro-inflammatory state is going to uh, be involved in endothelial activation with upregulation of adhesion molecules. All right, so uh, when we have this pro-inflammatory state, we're going to have an increase in our plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, which is right here. We're going to have a decrease uh, in our endothelial plasma, uh, our endothelial protein C receptor here. And we're also going to get uh, a decrease in protein C, thrombomodulin, and tissue factor pathway inha in, uh, inhibitor. All of these leading to a procoagulant state. All right. Now this activated endothelium is going to be releasing nitric oxide, which is going to cause relaxation of vascular smooth muscle, leading to hyper hypotension. And these mediators are going to cause vascular leakage and edema. Uh, so we're going to lose fluid through here, causing impaired uh, tissue perfusion, leading to organ dysfunction. Now, as mentioned here, we have our procoagulant state. This is going to lead to uh, microvascular thrombosis, or DIC. This, too, is going to lead to multi-organ failure. So I hope that uh, by going through this, uh, this image really puts everything together, uh, that you'll be able to... Oh. I forgot, we have to come over here to our metabolic abnormalities. So we also have our TNF and our IL-1 and stress-induced hormones, such as glucagon, glucocorticoids, growth hormone, which are going to cause these metabolic abnormalities, so insulin resistance and hyperglycemia, leading once more to organ dysfunction. Okay, so as you can see, this picture really has everything you need to know, and I encourage you to use this uh, as a study guide to go through and make sure you understand everything that causes uh, the findings of uh, a septic shock. And I'd like to finish just with three questions so you can see how well you've understood what it is we've been talking about for the last uh, 12 minutes or so. So what is the principal pathogenic mechanism of cardiogenic shock? What is the principal pathogenic mechanism of hypovolemic shock? And then finally, not just to list the five factors that play major roles in the pathophysiology of septic shock, but to understand how they work and how they have this complex interplay together. And you may find that figure to be very useful uh, in, in covering that. And as always, I'd like to thank you for your time, and I hope you found this useful.